So we now need to go from the exploration we had of those long-term causes of the Great War and how tensions have been building based around militarism, imperialism, and nationalism for roughly two decades to understanding the ways in which those forces end up bringing all of the European continent into conflict with itself. Um, and so to do that, we will then turn to our map of the July crisis. So here, um, we are going to go through these steps one by one, and, and I encourage you to follow along and take some notes about each step and some additional context I'll give you for it, uh, which I hope will help us understand how those forces, particularly the alliance system, end up manifesting themselves in this really complicated and hugely devastating uh, conflict. So to begin with, um, we've talked about this as a powder keg, the, these long-term forces. The fuse gets lit when on uh, June 28th, so we actually need to go to a step negative one. This is not on here. I apologize. So it's in Sarajevo, right, you have, I'm sorry, you have Sarajevo right there. Um, on June 28th, 1914, uh, uh, Serbian nationalist, a, a man named Gavrilo Princip, who is a member of this Serbian nationalist group, independence group, called the Black Hand, uh, assassinates Archduke Franz Ferdinand as a political act working to uh, achieve Slavic, pan-Slavic independence, right? Trying to bring all these Slavic countries together, some of which have gained independence, some of which have not, create them into a larger Slavic state independent of Hungary. And so assassinating the Archduke is a political act of terrorism meant to achieve this goal. This sets off um, a month-long series of events that ends up bringing the whole continent into war with itself. So the first thing that then happens, or the next thing that then happens, so sort of step zero if we're counting along here after step negative one, Austria-Hungary turns to its traditional ally, Germany, in order to seek support for their military course of action. Right? Austria-Hungary, of course, is, is furious about the fact that the Archduke has been assassinated and wants to ensure that they have political support um, and military support, possibly, to address and punish Serbia, who they feel is behind this, and there's some evidence that Serbia loaned weapons and, um, you know, covert aid to the Black Hand in this assassination. And so uh, Austria-Hungary wants Germany's assurance to do whatever uh, they see fit to punish them. Now, these two, of course, have this dual alliance going back to 1879, and, of course, they have the shared nationalist identity that binds them together as both being German-speaking uh, states. So Austria-Hungary asks Germany, this is step zero, for its support in punishing Serbia. And in response, Germany offers to Austria-Hungary what's called the blank check. So they essentially tell Austria-Hungary, whatever you see fit to do as a way to punish uh, Serbia is appropriate, and we will support you in that course of action. And with that assurance, Austria then begins to take a much harsher, firmer stance than they might otherwise have done, though, of course, the counterfactual is impossible to say. So now, after a few weeks of diplomatic wrangling, Austria puts together and offers an ultimatum to Serbia. The goal of this ultimatum, which is a, you must accept all of these conditions or else, right, and the or else in this case is we will go to war with you, it uh, leads to Austria offering a set of humiliating demands to Serbia, which Austria hopes Serbia will reject. So some of the demands, for instance, just to give a sense of how humiliating they are, um, they uh, the Austrians insisted that all Serbian diplomacy in the future be nice and kind um, and, and sort of deferential to Austria-Hungary. Uh, it insisted that Serbians and the Serbian state give up any claims or hopes to a larger pan-Slavic state. It demanded that Serbia suppress any anti Austro-Hungarian publications. Uh, it demanded that Serbia dissolve any secret nationalist societies. So that's just an example of four of, the, of these ten, but hopefully you get the picture that these are humiliating. So um, then I, we go to step, I guess, 1.5 here. So the Serbians, of course, are humiliated and angry about this. They reject, in unsurprising terms, these demands. And after that rejection, now we go to step two. Austria declares war on Serbia. So war has officially broken out as of July 29th. At this point, it's still a localized war, but here's where all of these um, alliances start kicking into gear. 
On this map, uh, it, it has the step three of the British fleet moving to its wartime base. So even though Great Britain is still kind of distant from the conflict, uh, there's clear knowledge that the British have that something is going to be happening. And so they begin sort of organizing their navy uh, for wartime activity. But the next really crucial step here is Russia's decision. So the next day after Austria has invaded Serbia, Russia, who we know if we look at our uh, Venn diagram of alliances, has pledged not a specific, not made a specific treaty or an alliance with the Serbians, but offered this larger pledge of aid because both are Slavic peoples. The Russians view themselves as a Slavic um, big brother, protector for the Serbs. And so um, that next day, Russia begins mobilizing its troops. And what this means and why it's so significant is that Russia basically isn't declaring war, but they are beginning to call up troops, put them on trains, get them equipped with weapons, and send them to the border between Russia and uh, Austria-Hungary in order to presumably uh, fight a war, right? The, you don't mobilize your troops if you're just interested in getting them some fresh air. The goal here is, is to have them use military force against the Austro-Hungarians. So it isn't an official diplomatic declaration of war, but it is pretty close to it. Um, so then next, the Austro-Hungarians, in response, mobilize their troops and begin sending them to this front of the, of the conflict. And now, at this point, it's clear what Austria wants Germany to do in terms of this blank check, right? Germany has asked, excuse me, Austria-Hungary has asked Germany to sign a blank check for, or rather the value of the check is for one war with Russia. And as a result, um, Germany does precisely what Austria-Hungary wants them to, and Germany is the one to first declare war on Russia the next day, August 1st. So at this point now, the war has gone from being a localized conflict to being an international conflict. Um, it's important to note how different this action is compared to how Bismarck might have run this scenario. If we reflect on those wars of German unification, I hope you'll recall that Bismarck consistently structured his conflicts in a way where the Germans or the Prussians at the time were always the ones getting attacked rather than going on the offensive. And in this case, Wilhelm II, um, no stranger to militarism and aggression, is the one to go on the offensive first. Because Germany is the one that declares war on Russia, Russia is now able to invoke the 1894 defensive alliance they have with the French. And so later that very same day, because France and Russia have pledged mutual support to one another, the French mobilize their troops and begin marching them to what will be a Western Front. Um, and at this point, Germany responds in kind, right? Two days later, step eight, now Germany has declared war on France. And the entire scenario that Bismarck had been worried about after the Franco-Prussian War has come to fruition. Germany has to fight a two-front war because of this complicated entangling of alliances, and particularly this Franco-Russian alliance that sandwiches Germany in between. Now, since the early 20th century, Germany has had a plan for this, um, constructed by a military general named Schlieffen, um, created, creatively entitled the Schlieffen Plan. And the Schlieffen Plan is, is a vision about how to win this two-front war, knowing that it's likely to happen. If it happens, and you have to fight both France and Russia, how do you win a, a war on a Western front and on an Eastern front. And the underlying assumption that will let this happen is that Russia is still not very industrialized. Russia will be slow to mobilize its troops. Russia has a lot of difficulty moving um, personnel and weapons and supplies via railroad. And so it's going to take them, German military planners assume, about five weeks uh, to get from the interior of the country, cities like Moscow and so on, to this shared front with Austria-Hungary and Germany. Um, the Germans are not crazy in this notion. Remember, the Russians lost the Crimean War because of a lack of industrialization. More recently, in 1904-1905, the Russians lost the Russo-Japanese War uh, in pretty stark fashion because they were not terribly well industrialized. And so there's pretty good evidence that the Germans have that Russian industrialization and movement of troops via railroad is not an effective or efficient thing. Um, but in order to make this happen, this Schlieffen plan, and win this two-front war, you have to first invade and defeat France very quickly, 
then hop on your own German trains, get across the country, and arrive at the Eastern Front right as they hope the Russian troops will be arriving and give you enough time to then fight and defeat the Russian troops, leading to the victory for these central powers. That's the underlying assumption. But to do this and to win this war quickly, the Germans have to cut through the easiest route, which is the very flat-lying country of Belgium. Belgium became independent in 1830, and since 1839, because of its vulnerable position between you know, then Prussia and France, it has been a neutral country, but has sought the backup of Great Britain to remain neutral. So since 1839, Britain has pledged to protect Belgian neutrality, meaning if any country invades Belgium, that Great Britain will swoop in and protect it. So the problem in this case, of course, is that the Schlieffen Plan calls for invading Belgium to get to France, to defeat France. And that's what happens the next day. Germany invades Belgium because this is the fastest route to get to France. And by invading Belgium, it then brings Great Britain into this conflict as well. And so Britain upholds its pledge made in 1839 and declares war on Germany the very next day on August 4th. And now, as you can see, we have two clear blocks coming into conflict with each other. The central powers of Germany, excuse me, of Germany and Austria-Hungary, and the uh, allied powers, they're called, of Great Britain, France, and Russia all fighting each other.